Okay, we ended the last uh, uh, lecture by discussing the uh, uh, utilitarian uh, ethical theory, which is that we should always act so as to bring about the greatest happiness for the greatest number, and Kant's ethical theory that we should always act so that the rule of our action could be willed by us to be a universal law, and then we raised objections to both those. Now, a further reminder is in order, and it's very important. And it's one of the reasons I call these models of moral reasoning, because I wanted to distinguish them from the real embodied contexts in which moral conflicts come up. And one of the ways to do that is to, is to direct an objection at Kant, and then a direct one at sort of both theories. And this is one more objection for Kant then. What happens when you're trying to will a universal principle in a situation where two principles are clearly good, and yet you can't do them both and one has to fall? The classic case is this. In fact, it's not a classic case. Our moral life is filled with situations where it isn't just right or wrong. Most of us know in those cases what to do. We may not do it, but we know what we ought to do. The really interesting cases in our moral life is where there are two things that look good, and we can't do them both. So for example, this is a very thin philosopher's example. I'll give you a thicker one later. So for example, someone comes to your door who looks like they may have worked for the CIA and says, where's your roommate? Now, it seems that you could act on the principle, a hallowed biblical commandment, thou shalt not lie, and your roommate's in there, and you go, Bill's in there. But you see a little, you know, bulge in the guy's pocket, a, a national security patch, and you know Bill used to be a drug-smoking crazed person. So you don't feel safe for Bill. And it seems that there's another principle equally universalizable that one should act so as to protect the innocent, and you know Bill's innocent. The other guy doesn't, but you know it. There are two rules, both perfectly good Kantian rules, right? Be willing to be, act by them all the time. Be willing to rule them both. The problem is you can't do both. You've got to pick one. So, and this is an interesting part for utilitarian theories, I guess, a little better. What you fall back on in that situation looks like utilitarianism. You go, well, which one of these is going to, you know, lead to the best results? And you just blithely lie to the guy, I hope, and say, Bill ain't here. Well, you broke Kant's rule, but you had to break one of them. That doesn't seem that that helps Kant's theory. In fact, it doesn't help it at all. It doesn't help utilitarian theory much either, though, as I'm about to point out, because both theories fail to capture real moral conflicts as they're embodied in problematic situations. So now, unfortunately, instead of referring to a movie that all of you have seen, although some of you may have seen it, uh, I can, I'll refer to a book, or it's actually a movie too, and a moral dilemma in the book that I think gives us a sense for this. Uh, it's a book by John Fowles called The Magus. I hope some of you have read it. If you haven't, there's also a movie with Anthony Quinn called The Magus with the same moral dilemma in it, and here it is. A mayor of a small Greek village, being occupied during the Second World War by the Nazis, uh, there are some resistance fighters in town, only three of them, but they shoot three German officers on the beach. So the German officers decide to retaliate, and they bring into the center of the square a thousand of the women and children of the city and put them in this little encirclement. They capture the three resistance fighters and, of course, symbolically put them on three posts. Very nice. They bring the mayor out, and now he, they give him the following choice. And you would think that a moral theory might help with this. They say, look, if you shoot the three in front of your townspeople, then we'll let everybody out of the pen. So there's a good utilitarian thing you ought to do, right? Shoot them quick, because that's three lives against a thousand, and the utilitarian calculation is simple. Shoot them for the greater good. Even though shooting them is wrong, according to Kant, you do it 
because there's nothing else you really can do, do it, it's for the greater good. So the utilitarian principle looks overwhelming in this case. On the other hand, you might have the insight that you couldn't do it anyway, the Germans might shoot those three and the thousand, but you couldn't do it. That would be the Kantian insight. Now it turns out though in our real moral lives things are much muddier than that because he struggles with the decision and decides to shoot the three guys. Safest thing to try. So he goes up and he begins to shoot them and the Germans have pulled a small trick on him. They've unloaded the rifle so he can't shoot them. He'll have to club them to death. Now, according to these very pretty moral theories that we've been discussing, should that make any difference? Haven't we abstracted from any difference it should make? Should it make any difference? Clearly the answer is no, it shouldn't. The same calculation should apply. Just a you know, different club, utilitarian, good utilitarian. I can club them, just shoot them. It's a little bit harder, take longer, but I can, same calculation. So he starts to raise the club up to hit the guy in the center who utters the word freedom, the Greek word for freedom. He drops the rifle. The Nazis kill all the thousand and the three. That moral story I've related to you, not simply for its barbarism, but to show you that in embodied contexts, it may not do a damn bit of good to know the rule. You may not be able for embodied reasons to club another human to death, even if it is the right thing to do. So that is to remind us that the moral life is complex. These theories are abstractions from the real communities, societies, and systems of oppression under which we learn to follow moral rules. You've got to remember that to understand anything about politics or morality, right? Is that in real situations, the simple rules of either one of these views, utilitarian, Kantian, may not work. They may not work because you woke up that day with a toothache. In other words, life has many contingencies and you just may not be doing the right thing one day because your face hurts too much. You, it may not be as dramatic, in other words, as the example from the film. But that example is supposed to, in a very striking way, remind you that the moral life is filled with ambiguities and that the problems you may face in making a decision of that kind have a large background. Okay. I want to stop with that uh, in terms of the discussion of, of Kant and Mill's, uh, uh, of Kant and Mill, in particular of utilitarian theories for a moment, I'll return to them later, and, uh, and Kantian style theories. By far, I think the most influential of the, of the two in our society, especially when we justify public policies, are the utilitarian principles. It's clear to me now that our state isn't run on Kantian principles because we treat differential groups differently. And Kant wouldn't accept that. So then we have to have other kinds of justifications, which is that some greater good must come about or should come about. So I will return.